uh, welcome to a Pub Talk Communications group. We're pleased to be able to host the first <laughs> sharing of best practices uh, for the Rural Quality Foundation. I'm glad that you all could be here and uh, talking with Bob before he started. If, if nothing else, uh, he got to see some rain today. And so, uh, you know, he's actually yeah. really, really yeah. pleased yeah. with that. Did um, I have burn me or not? We, like, like all of you as in your organizations uh, at a public communication group, certainly can uh, improve in the areas of quality and uh, continuous improvement. Uh, but there are some things that we're doing here that uh, Heather kind of asked me to talk a little bit about, uh, where we have a, a good focus on quality, uh, continuous improvement that we're proud of, and things that we're really striving to do better at. Um, and I just want to mention a few of those. One is really just more in the, in the area of leadership. Uh, that if you're you know, from the city area here, you probably recognize or realize that we've had some recent changes uh, at the top of our company. Uh, with David Thompson, our, our former president and publisher, just recently retiring. And Chris Rain, who was our executive vice president, just, just stepped in just as of last week, really, uh, September 1st, uh, to, to take over the reins of our media division. Uh, something that we're very excited about here at uh, the company, obviously, with, with all change comes heartburn. But, uh, one of the things that uh, Chris did right off the bat that I thought was just interesting to share, the number of people know, uh, that the very first full week in his new role as president and publisher, he called a meeting with our leadership team, and we sat down, and Patty Hannon, our VP of advertising, was there, and we sat down, and basically the agenda was to talk about a couple of things, but the primary one was trust, um, and the thing that he wanted to do to not only establish, because we, we've had trust there, but to enhance that and improve that, and so we went through about a two-hour exercise where he just looked at us and asked us to talk to him about what we don't like about him. Um, so as a leadership team, oh, I never us did that. The it take too long. It was a very exercise. It took about five, ten minutes for us to get going. Uh, he brought a, a stack of literature just to read uh, while we while we waited to get going. Um, and so he challenged us. He said we'd be there as long as it took. And we ended up filling up two poster boards. <laughs> Um, you know, there are not many leaders who probably would go through that type of exercise, but I thought that was something that's worth sharing because that shows that there is an interest even at the you know, very top of our, of our company. At, we had a lot uh, of slam books quality, when I was in school. Uh, quality, leadership, <laughs> uh, quality relationships and continuous improvement because uh, we believe that Chris is going to take those things to heart that we did talk about uh, and, and continue to, to increase and strengthen uh, our teamwork. So yeah. uh, that was one thing I wanted to mention. Another thing, just, just real quick, from a quality standpoint, uh, Chris has already uh, challenged our news information team, our journalism uh, folks, to uh, strive for uh, a Pulitzer. Uh, we have, in our 108 years of existence, have, have not received a Pulitzer Prize, um, although we certainly would say that we deserve a few of those. Um, we've not received one, so that is something that uh, a prize that obviously um, honors excellence in journalism, and so we've set our sights on that. And, uh, currently, uh, Kelly Fry, our editor, is, is working with her team on, on, on the path that we should set ourselves on to go about achieving uh, one of those one of those awards. So that's something that uh, hopefully we'll be hearing an announcement in the coming years uh, that we, we've attained that goal. And then the third thing I'd mention in the area uh, that we're focusing on uh, in terms of quality is we really just customer service, which is going to be a very important thing. But one real specific way that we, uh, as an organization, have been focused on that for a number of years is uh, in our, it's not just our, our press room and our production group, it's a teamwork effort, but there's a, a measurement that we call on-time uh, press finish. So depending on the day, uh, we're shooting to, to have all of the uh, papers printed by one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning with the end goal of having those papers at everybody's uh, driveways you know, no later than 6 a.m. So it's an effort to make sure that there's con consistent and continuous uh, customer service. Well, that on-time press finish goal that we had, uh, we hit back in 2008, uh, 600 and, right, 636 days in a row of, of getting uh, the, the papers off the presses uh, by that deadline. Um, and of course, all streaks are coming to an end, so we've had our hiccups here and there. Uh, but the important thing is after each time that streak ends, there is a post-mortem. It's a constructive post-mortem by the group that are involved to figure out what went wrong, why did the streak end, and what can we do to address uh, those kinds of things. Um, we've had multiple streaks since that time. Our most recent one ended uh, just about, uh, I think, seven to 10 days ago, but we ended at 262 days in a row where we had that on-time uh, press finish. We've done a lot of industry um, research and conversations, um, and we don't, we don't believe that, and we've been told this by many folks outside of Oklahoma City, that there are no other media companies that even come close to 262 days in a row 
that particular measurement, which we all look at, uh, much less the 636 days. So obviously we have that big goal of, of surpassing the 636 someday, but the important thing as it relates to today is, is that we do have a process in place where we try to analyze you know, what, what caused that to come to an end, prevent those from happening again, uh, to continue with, with that type of quality of continuous improvement. So just thought those were a few things that were maybe a little bit unique to our industry and our company that might be of interest to you all. Uh, but you're here today, of course, to, to hear more from uh, Mr. Bob Hintz. Uh, so let me introduce uh, him before he comes up to speak to us uh, while you're having lunch. Uh, Bob is the uh, CEO and president of Fries and Nichols, who we're going to hear a little bit more about here in a moment. Um, I believe part of this bio is, is in the information you have on your table, but I'm going to give you a little bit additional as well. Uh, Bob has led his company uh, through the difficult financial period that followed 9-11. Um, and into a highly productive expansion that continues even today at Freese and Nichols. Uh, Freese and Nichols have pursued a continuous improvement program during that time period that focuses on processes to yield consistent technical excellence. So that's something we're going to hear more about, I think, from Bob in just a little bit. Uh, just for, in terms of background, Bob had a master's degree in civil engineering at Texas A&M University. I don't know if you're planning on talking about the Big 12, SEC, <laughs> Not going to go there. Not going to go there. <laughs> Good idea. Do that if you want to. Um, but Bob's leadership and his, his style includes quarterly presidents round tables with randomly selected employees and direct briefings of employees via visits to local offices and video conference. He's insistent that senior corporate leaders lead the firm's leadership development program, and he has fostered an atmosphere of open, direct communication throughout Reese and Nichols. So that's a little bit about Bob as, as a leader, which I think we all interested in. One other thing that's important to know is that uh, he's a familiar presence in community organizations in the Fort Worth uh, area. Uh, Bob is the chairman of the North Texas Commission. Um, the mission of that organization is to enhance the overall economic vitality and the quality of life in North Texas. He's chaired local United Way campaigns uh, there, and he serves as an advocate for children and education in a number of different areas as well. Uh, one last thing, Bob was named the 2008 Engineer of the Year by the Fort Worth chapter of the Texas Society of Professional Engineers. In the fall of 2010, was named a fellow by Leadership Fort Worth. So I think you can see he's clearly uh, qualified to address quality in a number of different areas. Uh, please help join me in welcoming Bob Pence. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon. I probably need to. I'm I'm mic'd, but I'm evidently I'm only mic'd for the camera, and you wouldn't be able to hear me. I'd like to say, as president and CEO, I would never ask my owners to come in and tell me what they don't like about me. <laughs> I'm a little bit smarter than that, and it would it would kill about ten days of production. Uh, I am delighted to be here today. Uh, I was just recently up here in the spring for my nephew's graduation from Oklahoma State University, and I got to hear the governor speak. We got a couple of uh, orange coats, I guess they call them here. Uh, orange is not my favorite color, uh, being an Aggie. But uh, I got to hear the governor speak and uh, really, really enjoyed it, and, and I love the campus up there. So I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to I have a little presentation today. I've, I've, I've cobbled together several issues that uh, Heather had asked me to talk about. So I'm going to have some messages for those of you who have never been on a journey or are com contemplating being on the journey. And then I have some messages for those who are on the journey and that maybe just started in the kind of time frame you need and the kind of effort you need to put in. And then I have some information to show why it's all worth your time and effort. So uh, let's get started. Um, Friesen Nichols, uh, we're 117 years old. Uh, our founder came down from Illinois and built the first water pump station for the city of Fort Worth, which that building still stands, but the pumps don't work. Uh, and it's not his fault. They were the old steam uh, pumps. They just don't use them anymore. Uh, we... Uh, we're located only in Texas, although we do work outside the state. We've actually worked for several cities in Oklahoma. It's been a great experience for us. It says we're at 450 uh, people. We're actually now at 480 people since this presentation was put together. Uh, one of our great clients in Fort Worth is Chesapeake Energy down in the Barnett Shale in Fort Worth. 
and we've gotten into the energy business, and it, I will tell you it has, uh, it has not only caused, allowed us to increase in our staff size, but it's saved uh, quite a few jobs, and, and uh, I have nothing but high praise and blessings for uh, Chesapeake Energy. They've done a great job. They've been a great community partner. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's important that I give you a little perspective about an engineering firm because I'm going to be talking about things in here that look like they're really uh, kind of out in, you know, liberal, if you will, or off the wall or outside the box. And uh, one of our greatest challenges as an engineering firm is that we have to hire engineers. And uh, do we have any engineers in the group? God bless you, I'm about to nail you here, but I just want you to know. <laughs> I want you to know I'm also an engineer, but to give you a perspective, the difference between an introverted engineer and an extroverted engineer is the extroverted engineer will look at your shoes when they're talking to you. <laughs> so this, this is not, it's not the most communicative group you'll ever run into. We, uh, we did, we were awarded, now we can't say we won the award, which doesn't make any sense to me, so I just say we won it and, and nobody shoots me, but we did uh, receive this, the Malcolm Baldridge Award. What we're particularly proud of is that we're the first engineering design firm to ever win this award. And uh, uh, I used to think we were the only engineering firm that was on this journey, and uh, since we've won it, a firm out of New Mexico and one out of St. Louis have called, and actually we've had them come down and visit us, uh, to help them on their journey. So we were delighted to see some more engineering firms getting into it. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Baldridge and the criteria. Uh, I want to talk about our journey, how we got on it. And, uh, you know, we got, we got on it from a burning platform. And so if there's somebody who's contemplating the journey and has not yet had the burning platform you have to jump off of, I encourage you to do it. It's a lot easier when you really aren't trying to survive to get on this journey. Uh, I'm gonna talk some about our strategic planning process. We have a little twist to ours that we had to learn the, well, not necessarily the hard way, but uh, to improve our system. And uh, we'll talk about some of the changes we've had in the journey. Y'all probably recognize this fellow. Uh, you know, the question is, what's the most pressing issue uh, you're facing today? Is it financial woes? And these certainly are difficult times. Are you getting uh, pressure from your customers, poor service performance, disengaged employees? Uh, if, if those kind of things are going on, and we certainly had them going on, then there are some answers out there. You know, what if you could resolve these issues and, re and, and just basically achieve a consistent level of, of high performance? Uh, the profit line you see up there is ours. Uh, and I'll go into a little more detail about our burning platform, but I think you can identify where it is. It's the one below the zero line. And uh, that's what we've done since, since we've got on the journey. But uh, we have found that this criteria that we use is a tremendous framework for us. You know, it is a set of criteria that design, uh, defines performance excellence and best practices, but I think the important thing here is it provides an integrative management framework for guiding your journey. I think the simplest way to say this is if somebody came to you and says, uh, Bob, I'm going to start a business, can you help me? I would get out the seven Baldrige criteria and say, here's your framework, go in this direction, I think you'll be fine. It just lays it out. In fact, I don't know why they don't teach it in business school, because this is really what it's all about. So why take the journey? Uh, there are thousands of organizations that are in this journey, have seen performance improvements. Uh, what I will tell you about, uh, if, you, uh, if you were to look, there's a great article called Mug Full of Change, and uh, it was about all these soup of the day programs, uh, flavor of the day that people got into in business, and you, you got a nice mug for it, and uh, you know, and then you had this collection of mugs. What you found was is that it wasn't a sustainable way to run your business. And what we have found with the Baldrige criteria is it's a highly sustainable way to run your business. Well, let's talk about our journey. Uh, again, uh, would point out all our offices are in Texas. We are actually contemplating uh, going out of state. Uh, we have... Uh, done work outside of the state uh, in different formats, but uh, 
Uh, we did foray into Mexico uh, for a few years, opened an office down in Monterey, figured we broke the code and how to do it, found out we didn't, got out, got a nice little tax break for our owners uh, on their uh, S-Corporation deal. But in Texas, what we've run into is a tremendous population growth, 23%. Uh, uh, the competition, uh, and I've seen it. I've been at Freeze Nickel since 1978, and every time there's a recession, we get a flurry of national firms coming into Texas to open up their uh, businesses. So the competition has, it just continues to increase. And quite frankly, the only way to uh, really deal with it is make yourself so good you don't care who shows up. And uh, the way the clients... Uh, basically awarded work change down in Texas. Now, uh, when I first came to Freeze and Nichols, we had clients that we were the only engineers for them. We didn't have to compete. They called you up and said, we've got a job for you. And uh, we had several clients that way. And then uh, over the years, you now have to compete for just about every dis uh, assignment. And you have to differentiate yourself. So we, we saw a tremendously increased competition. In 1995, uh, we lost money for the first time in the history of the company, uh, minus 1.7% profit. Uh, that means no bonuses. Uh, we cut the uh, principal salary 10%, and my oldest daughter started college the same year. It was, it was a lot of fun. It, it certainly is an argument for saving some money. But we had a real lack of accountability. We had no defined sales process. And our strategic plan was something that we met, had a great time putting it together, and said, see you same time next year. And that was the end of it. And so we have changed all that. And uh, where it all started is Bob Herchard. Uh, Bob was president and CEO of the company at the time. He is the first non-engineer president and CEO of Freeze and Nichols. Scared all of us engineers to death when he came on board. Used to be the city manager of Fort Worth. Uh, had left that job and was working uh, at head of HR for one of the local banks. He was actually an advisory director on our board, and uh, we elected him as the new president. And uh, he was also on the board of Harris Hospital System, who had a fellow named Clayton Fitzhugh, who used to be at Florida Power and Light, which won the Baldrige. And he was there to help Harris uh, go after the quality award. And so Bob Herchard said, okay, hey, can you help us? And that's when we got this thing started, using the Baldrige criteria. Um, if you look at, and what he really kicked us off, and I'm going to, I want to paint a picture in your mind. I, I look at my company like a three-legged stool. There's management, there's marketing and sales, and there's technical excellence. And you've got to make all those legs the same length and long. And uh, you have to have processes in all three of those areas. And so where we started off, because that's where our problem was, was on the CI management, continuous improvement management. And that's where we kind of kicked this in. And it's, this is kind of the model for our first uh, management system. you strategic. Develop your strategies. You deploy the strategies. Uh, you improve. You monitor the performance. And we always put celebrate the success, but uh, the first few years we didn't always have much to celebrate, but we got there. But that, that was kind of our initial model. And uh, this kind of segues into a discussion I'd like to have with you on strategic planning. We, uh, we changed pretty quick about our strategic planning from a, a once a year deal where we met and put together a nice book, uh, where we started actually getting in and putting together a very deliberate plan. And as we did that, we found that from the strategic planning committee that they were doing a really good job looking at one, two, maybe up to three years. But there were things beyond that horizon we weren't getting our eyes on. So what I did was I created a futures committee. I actually got the idea from my church. We just merged, and they had a futures committee. I like the title, so we now have a futures committee. I'm sure God had something to do with that, but it worked. And so uh, the futures committee looks at that five to 15 years, and then we have a strategic planning team, uh, which does look at three to five years. And then the technical and corporate groups, when we deployed it to them, they got a one-year look out. They come back and give us their deployment plan for the year. So that's, that's the basic element of it. The, the key on that futures committee is that longer time frame. And there are things out there that, uh, 
uh, were coming up that you didn't need to necessarily do anything today on it, but you had to get your eyes around it and you had to start monitoring it or you had to take some hard work at it. This Futures Committee has really done some great things for us since we've got it. It got us into the energy business. It got us into our, our green uh, approach, our sustainability approach. Uh, it has uh, helped us with some of the legislative issues on design build where we got our eyes focused on it. What I have found in my company, and I think it's true in all your companies, that if you get your eyes on something get focused on it, you can handle it and do a pretty good job. It's the stuff you're not doing anything about that gets you in trouble. So that was kind of the strategic planning team takes care of that uh, unit level perspective. Futures puts together the long-term approach. One of the things we've used the Futures Committee is, and this is just a great question, is, and, and our main client base is cities, uh, is what, it, uh, what do they look like in 10 to 15 years? And so our Futures Committee uh, put together uh, these great questions. How will they get their revenue? Uh, what new services will they demand? And how do we differentiate ourselves? And so we kind of took a three-pronged approach, if you will, uh, looking at the industry experts, bringing the futurists in, which we love to bring them in. They're kind of a lot of fun, but when they leave, you're not sure what they told you, other than that was a lot of fun. And, and it's like, no kidding, that's going to happen. Uh, but the client input, and what our futures committee did is we did some client seminars. We brought in, in our uh, uh, city sector, some city managers, and our river authorities, water district, brought in some general managers, and brought them into our futures committee, and basically had a great panel discussion on where they saw the changes coming in the future. We got some tremendous feedback from that. And uh, from that, we're able to actually, quite frankly, put together some pretty good plan approach how we differentiate ourselves in the future. But, you know, it's just kind of a, a, a cycle. You re review the materials, you ID these trends and drivers, discuss the impact and importance, and, uh, you know, what do we do as the next step? And I'm, I'm going to show you another slide in a minute, but, you know, do we, do we need to research it? Do we need to monitor it? Do we need to turn it over to the Strategic Planning Committee and say, get on this right now? I hate these ones that cascade out. They drive me crazy, which tells you I didn't put this show together. <laughs> um, basically, what we do, if we need more in information on a topic, we're going to assign a research team. Uh, if we got a long-term interest, we may just monitor it. This was the case on design build on how it was going to impact our business, and uh, it took the legislator, legislature quite a few years to really address it. Uh, Midterm interest, we may assign a project, uh, uh, may turn it over like uh, develop the use of IT tools for greener infrastructures. We may say, we may put a CI team on top of that and say, hey, nail this thing down, figure out what we need to do. And on short-term interest, we're going to turn it over to that strategic planning team and say, you need to address this and you need to address it now. So we, we, depending on what comes out of the futures committee and how we assign it depends on how far out it is. But I feel like we've got a pretty good handle now on uh, things that are going to impact us in the future. And this is our strategic planning process overall, and we are really faithful about this. Um, I'm going to tell you a few things we do. Uh, we have, the, in, in establishing the strategic direction, we do the external scan and the market scan. We look what's out there driving the markets. We may revise our mission vision guiding principles, but uh, we develop our strategic Im imperatives. Uh, and then we start developing the strategies. There's growth strategies, uh, market service uh, goals and action. But one of the ones we, we weren't looking at before, we look at now is for everything we want to do, we sit down and say, what are, what are our capabilities in that area and where's our gaps? And uh, that, that's a weakness that uh, some companies don't figure that out and then they don't understand why they don't get it done. And then we deploy it down and we have a planning retreat. Our uh, groups come back with their annual operating plans. Uh, we approve them, and then we PDCA the whole process. But we do this annually. Uh, we're very faithful to it. And uh, for every action in our strategic plan, we have a measurable goal to determine if it was successful. And we put that in our balanced scorecard, and we check that quarterly. And uh, we went from 
I think the one year we had like 90 actions. We're down to about 30 actions, and we're completing almost all of them. One thing I do like about our company, if we come up with a bad idea that was really stupid, we stop doing it. <laughs> I, I know you all can identify with that sometimes. It's really hard to, well, the president wanted to do this, so I guess we better. But I'm really blessed in my, all my other owners in the company. If they think I'm doing something stupid, they'll come tell me. Now I want to kind of shift, and this is a message to those companies out there that say, why don't you do everything in a year? This will just be a year's effort, and uh, we'll be good to go. If you look at this chart, the red line is the industry average on profitability. We do have that data to track. The blue line is our profitability. And uh, when we invested a lot of money the first few years when we got into the CI program, and I asked my CFO when I took over, I said, okay, was it worth the investment? And she looked at our profitability 20 years back from 95, and basically we rode the economy. If the economy was good, we did real well, and if the economy was bad, we did real bad. Now what we've changed is, and you can see the 9-11 impact, uh, I don't care what the economy is, we're going to do well. And uh, yes, I took over after 9-11, but see, that's not a bad thing. Because when I was in the Army, I learned that you never took over company command or the unit that won company of the year the year before. <laughs> Give me that dog, I'll get it dressed up, and we'll be a hero. But this is our journey since 95, and these are not just... What these are is the years we put these different systems in. We started out with our continuous improvement management system. We started doing president's reviews where I sit down with every group manager every month. Now we've, as we've grown, I, I meet with them every other month with their division manager and the division managers got that responsibility to hold their feet to the fire. That's our accountability piece we got in. We started documenting our processes, which was a terrible struggle with our engineers. Our corporate side loved it, did it quickly, actually cut time. Engineers like pulling teeth from the hen's mouth, but we got them there. We didn't give them an option. Uh, started moving on innovation awards. The third leg on technical excellence, our TEP teams is our technical excellence program. I'll touch on that in a minute. Our business technology, we brought in a CIO, something, this is a case of we didn't know what we didn't know. We brought this guy on board. Now we know all these things. Wish we'd have done it sooner. And then the innovation. So these are things we employed over the years. You don't just sit down one day and say, okay, we're going to fix everything today. You know, go for the low fruit. Go for that immediate impact fixes and just be on a continuous uh, cycle of fixing things. Uh, a couple of things on technical excellence. Uh, this is Possum Kingdom Dam. Are any of you all familiar with that one? It's the one they've had all the fires around recently. This was a dam that was built in the Depression years under the works program. It's a, uh, it's a concrete buttress compression dam, which won't mean much to you out there, but there's not very much steel in it. And it's a power generating dam. And uh, uh, it's for the Brazos River Authority, and they call us one day and say, hey, we did our survey run we do every year, and the dam's moved four inches which is not a good thing for those that are living near dams, especially downstream. So uh, we did the fix on that. It was really a fascinating project. But uh, we have a technical excellence team on every service business unit area, which really means every discipline in the company. So if you're on the uh, road design TEP team, you're on that team with people from all the other offices, and they meet monthly or bi-monthly to improve uh, their technical capabilities. Uh, operationally, they do, that's where we get our processes uh, documented and defined, standards, et cetera, uh, monitoring new technology regulation changes. And, and something new that we're really getting into now with our TEPs, we're asking them to rate the skill set on every one of their engineers and determine what level they are. And this is going to be a great individual development type program, but it's, it, it's a nice piece. We just got presented with it. We've uh, done it with two of our uh, TEPs. And it's, it's going to be a quality thing for our folks. Uh, business technology, um, again, uh, since uh, Gary Sired's been on board, it's just amazing what he's done. Uh, and we just didn't know you could do those things. Uh, but uh, 
we got management portals. Every employee has a portal. Their dashboard tells them everything they're doing, what their utilization is, if they're involved in a project, where they are. We have e-resource through our computer system where we can balance workload. This has been a great blessing and savior for us these last two years. We do a lot of work sharing around the company, so we have engineers and corpus working on projects in Dallas, and uh, that has saved us from having to lay people off. Uh, we are a family organization. We're, quite frankly, that's our culture, and uh, we want to take care of people, and we've done a marvelous job, but this has really helped uh, to do that. Got to press a little harder. And then on innovation, uh, one of the things uh, we in our client surveys uh, on the innovation comment was one of our lower scores. Now, again, let's go back to that engineer thing. You know, uh, if you want a challenge, go talk to an engineer and say, hey, what have you done that's innovative? They haven't done anything innovative. Uh, I, I try to explain to my folks that engineers are problem solvers, and once the problem's solved, there's no more innovation involved in it. So it's a real challenge for us. So through our TEP teams, what we do is require every TEP team to submit their most innovative project. And they have to do a little write-up on it and all those things. And then we use that to send out for uh, state and national awards. It's been a very successful program. You really got to get the engineers into thinking about what's innovative. And it's a challenge. They're talking to, they're looking at your shoe when they're talking to you. Our net bookings, that's our new work. That's our contracted work. And uh, you can see since 96, uh, we've gone from 20 million in bookings to uh, 80 million. And uh, we ran through some sawtooth stuff. Uh, but what we found was is if somebody hit their goal and had a big booking, they waited till January 1 to book it. <laughs> so we put a stop to that. So, but some of the areas in our client area, uh, we started the client satisfaction surveys. We do those as a by email. We get about a 45% return, which is a phenomenal return rate. We develop our client-centered markets where we got focused by markets so you can identify those needs better. Our hedgehog concept, we stole that from good to great, Jim Collins' book. It's about what you can be best in the world at. And uh, I'm going to spend another minute on that because that's really paid off for us. But we're doing client seminars on different topics. Right now we've got a drought seminar we're putting together. Might be timely. I told them to hurry, it may rain. Uh, we brought in our integrated sales system, which is a Miller-Hyman process, which closed off our next big process on our marketing leg. And uh, a new internet site and new sales structure. So we've made improvements again over the years. and We've had good results. Uh, this is our uh, hedgehog concept. <clears throat> That doll there, we didn't know you could get a hedgehog doll. Back to tell you the truth, I've never seen a live one. But uh, we got that from the Baldrige examiners. At the end of their site visit, they pulled these out of their briefcase and gave them to us. So when we were able to announce that we were awarded, we gave every employee one of these. And uh, the most creative one was our corpus office, which decorated their tree with them, their Christmas tree, which I thought was pretty slick. But uh, we did meet, and we asked the question, what can we be best in the world at? And we got all kinds of answers, best dam designer, best road designer. We said, no, it has to be something that everybody in this company can make a contribution to. And we came up with being best to client service. I mean, the mail clerks engaged in that, the internal, uh, all internal uh, client service as well as external. This works. It's pushed down in depth. And, and I'll tell you, um, how many of y'all ever heard, how many of y'all ever bought clothes at Men's Warehouse or would admit it? <laughs> how many ever heard of Men's Warehouse? Okay, good. I've been in there, but I've never bought anything. But I remember hearing those ads driving to work every day, and then I read an article in Time Magazine about them, and basically what he did, the head guy, George, I think I got that right, he went down to that salesperson on the floor and empowered them to do whatever they could do to make that client customer happy. That works. And so we do tell our folks, now you can't walk in and give them a free million dollar contract, okay? We've got to use some judgment, but we give them and empower them to make that client happy. And we've got that, I feel, pushed down, and I think that's why we're doing well in these tough recession times. Client service is the name of the game. 
Uh, our client surveys, I don't know why they use that. It looks like spaghetti, but, um, but we do a lot of surveying and we get a lot of feedback. I read every survey that comes back into the company. And so does my senior leadership team. And it's not to, oh, we got a bad one, let's go nail somebody. Oh, we didn't get a good one, let's go talk to the client and see what kind of problem we have so we can solve it. <clears throat> In our uh, integrated sales system, we use the Miller-Hyman. Um, is anybody here familiar with the Miller-Hyman uh, system? Oh, good, I can tell you whatever I want about it. <laughs> It's a, a fairly complicated system. Uh, I'd like to say we use every element of it, but you don't. But we certainly use the gold and the blue sheets where you really identify that client and you talk about strategies about that client and the things you need to do. And it's how we identify all our future projects that go in our sales funnel. So it's a system that works well. There, there's other software systems out there. Okay, this is the one I'm most proud about. Uh, the red line on the bottom is uh, our employee satisfaction score. The blue line is our staff size. And again, it's now out of date. It's, it's at about 480 now. I am absolutely delighted that we can increase our staff at the rate we did and still increase our satisfaction score from a 4.3 to a 4.7 average out of 5. And we've done a lot of work in this area. In fact, Bob Hertert was the one that came in and said, you know, one of our values is to be the employer of choice for our employees. And, and we do those things. It helps us out. But we do an employee opinion survey faithfully every year. We make, we'll grab three or four things that come in immediately and make changes for improvement so the employees see that we do stuff with it. We created the f &N University our in-house training. Uh, this was a big investment on our part, but our survey, we asked our employees, what's most important to you, one to 10? Number one was working on challenging projects. Number two was professional development. And so we have two full-time professional development ODP people on our staff. And I don't think you'll find another engineering firm our size that has any. And I get other CEOs will ask me, how can you afford this? I can't afford not to do it, folks. This is the best investment we've ever made. I do insist, though, that the training will be done by our senior leaders in that class. I don't want somebody else raising my children, and I don't want to have somebody else teaching my folks what we believe and value in. We do a cultural assessment. I would have told you 20 years ago that that's foo-foo stuff. I will tell you now, it's very scientific, and it has a great value. <laughs> Individual development plans. Our leadership training plan. Uh, I'm very proud of this. We have some very focused leadership at the turning points. When you uh, come to a company, and I think it's true in all types, you lead self, you turn to lead others, to lead groups, to lead the company. At those three turning points, we have a year-long detailed leadership training class at each of those turning points, from PM certification to group manager training to senior leadership training. And it has paid off for us handsomely. Uh, career ladders we're doing, mentoring, technical coaching, a wellness. I'll touch on those pretty quickly. Here we go with the cascading thing here. Uh, we were very much a clan organization. Uh, that's why we didn't have any internal accountability. And, uh, you know, we're, we were a partnership that turned into a corporation that then again turned into a corporation because uh, you really don't turn into a corporation when you first do it because everybody still thinks like a partnership. We truly are a corporation now, but we moved, we've deliberately moved from clan to market, and now based on the feedback from our employees, we need to move from the hierarchy area up to the uh, ad hocracy, a little bit more innovative, a little more free thinking. Again, think about an engineering firm doing something like this. It's pretty interesting. Um, this is on our culture. We do uh, assess that culture uh, every year to two years. We uh, uh, come in and... Uh, See, we get employee surveys to see where we stand, and get the leadership team to see where they think we are and where we want to go. We do get our employees engaged in this. It, it, it's really been a good thing for us. We just got our last results, and we did it by office. And if it was a large office, we did it by a group within that office. And uh, my HR person brought it to me, and you could lay every one of them on top of each other. It just, there was about that much noise all the way around. 
And I asked her, I said, is this good or bad? <laughs> she said, I don't know if it's good or bad, but we've got a real strong culture here. So we see that we've got those values shared in Corpus, from Dallas to San Antonio, Houston, and uh, Fort Worth. And uh, it's just an important part of who we are. On a career development, uh, this is one that we, we continue to work on, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, but we do have career ladders for every position in the company. We do individual development plans for every employee in the company. And now we've uh, brought in a mentoring and coaching program. Uh, how many of y'all had great success with a mentoring program? Uh, I may need to talk to you afterwards because it's a challenge for us. It really is. And you know with the story, you go to the old guy who's mentoring, they say, oh, it never comes to see me. You go to the young guy, yeah, it never comes to see me. Uh, what do we got here? <laughs> so we're, we're still working the kinks out of this puppy. Okay, on professional development, uh, <clears throat> we do cascade down all our goals in the development plan. Uh, we look at the strategic objectives. We get the employees' needs. Our Fries Nichols University, again, is a great asset for us. Uh, the bottom one I want to touch on, a three-year new employee integration plan. Uh, we've put together a course workload. We want the new employees to take over their first three years at the company. I'd like to say this is a roaring success, but we've only been doing it for a couple of years, but it's, it's really helping out and uh, a lot of on the technical development uh, with the coaching. Uh, on the mentoring, uh, again, this is still a challenge for us. Uh, we, we, uh, we think we've got a good, good way to do this. We're waiting to see how the results are, but so far we're getting a good response from this. We are training the mentors and the mentorees so that they know what to expect, and I think that's helping us out. <clears throat> Wellness program. Uh, our problem is, can you all see the bottom? Is body weight. I'm a proud member of that group. Uh, what we have found with this, we use the United Health and they take their survey assessment. What we've seen is that the, uh, uh, we're not seeing these great results in health yet. What we're seeing great results in is people becoming aware and recognizing they need to do something. That number's doubled. So we think we're taking that first step and we'll continue on with that. So what's happened to us over the 15 years? Uh, our bookings have increased 190%. Our profits have increased 237%. Employee satisfaction from 4.3 to 4.7, uh, where we've grown over 45%. And, uh, you know, I, I feel very good about this. Um, oh, no, that's not true. I feel great about this. Uh, and i, I got to tell you what, i got a great bunch of folks on my leadership team and staff that really make this kind of thing happen. And uh, I'm kind of the eye candy of the organization. <laughs> I didn't think you'd buy that. Uh, but uh, we, we've done real well. And so, you know, how do you continue this journey? Uh, you really gotta have a compassion for it at the leadership level. What I will tell you that I've told to my company is the next, and I, I'm gonna probably transition out in about four years, <laughs> if they don't fire me first. Uh, I do get elected every year. But uh, uh, the next CEO of this company will be an advocate of Baldridge and continuous improvement, or they will not be the next CEO of this company. We cannot afford to get off this journey. You do have to have a champion. Uh, my CFO, Cindy Milraney, is our champion. She's a tremendous leader and done a great job. You really have to energize, engage your staff. Uh, employee engagement. You know, what they say is it's, you're not worried about the ones that aren't engaged. You want the ones that are, you're worried about the ones who are actively not engaged. And you really got to get that solved. But uh, it does bring a long-term stability on the leadership of the organization. This senior leadership training we're doing right now is my plan for the uh, leadership uh, change coming up. I'm taking my top 14 people, and we are teaching them everything they need to know about how to run the company. So they're getting nailed on every corporate function, how it integrates in the company, what it does for us, and how it uh, makes us better. Operations, strategic planning, uh, risk management, the whole nine yards. So when we're finished, I'm gonna have 14 people that have an idea on how this company operates. And uh, I think it'll be very easy to pick my successor. So, what's the payback? Well, I think the, I mentioned it earlier, and I wanna emphasize it, that the. The criteria is your roadmap. I mean, it's, 
You don't have to think about it. Just look at it. It tells you where to go. You know, it's like painting by numbers. You know, it's real easy. Uh, you can expect uh, improved results at each step. I will tell you, if you just think about saying we're going to do this and you do one thing about it, you're going to get the Hawthorne effect of improvement right off the bat, just the fact you're going in the right direction. But you really do have to have the commitment and time, and senior leadership must be the leader engaged in this. That's going to be the name of the game. So thank you for your time. I have no idea how time it took because I didn't know when I started. But uh, I really appreciate uh, being able to come up and speak to you all today. I'm very impressed with the turnout you have here and the, and the level. I, I do want to say I just came from Kansas City at the Baldridge. I know we have a lot of health care folks in here. You really need to go. Uh, I think it's Good Sam Samaritan Hospital in Illinois and listen to their story when they got on the journey where they were. I mean, it's not like they were killing everybody in Illinois, but it was close to, <laughs> to being one of the top hospital systems in the country. It's just an amazing story, and uh, I encourage you for the healthcare folks to go look at that example.